You don't, you don't have to think all that much. It's just wonderful. We have the Scriptures. We have the sure script right. written by God. Right. And, it, and it is uh, very easy to be a preacher and teacher of the Word of God because He's given you the words to give unto the people. Now, we've been studying here in the books of the Acts of the Apostles for a number of weeks. And um, the Lord Jesus Himself divided this book into three parts, just as He did with the book of Revelation. So, it's an easy division to follow. In uh, verse uh, 8 of chapter 1, when the Lord said, uh, Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. So the power of the Holy Ghost is given to us to be witnesses of His resurrection and His salvation. And He says then, You'll be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And as we go through the book, the Acts of the Apostles, the Lord, using the pen of Luke, the Holy Spirit inspiring Him, will break the book into, if you will, three sections, like we have up here on the board. We're seeing in this particular book, we're seeing the Lord Jesus Christ is at work. And He's working by the Holy Spirit through the Apostles to establish the beginning of His church. Chapters 1 through 7, the work was highlighted in Jerusalem. And the offer was made once more to the Jews to receive the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews. They rejected the offer the second time. And in chapters 8 through 12, and today we're in chapter 12, we'll be finishing that middle section, that the offer began to move outside of the city, Jerusalem proper, into Judea and Samaria, where there were a lot of half-breed Jews. And a lot of the work being done by the Apostle Peter. And in the 12th chapter today, we'll see kind of as the Lord finishes up the work with the Apostle Peter and will move us into the third section next few weeks in chapter 13 where the Word will go to the uttermost part of the earth to Gentiles through the Apostle to the Gentiles. That's the Apostle Paul. But today we're finishing up here in this middle section in Judea and Jerusalem and we come back into the region of Judea and Jerusalem, and we see the work that's being done. Now, if you remember our readings last week in Acts chapter 11, in verse 27, in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, coming from Jerusalem. And he signified by the Spirit, with a capital S, that's the Holy Spirit using this prophet to speak, that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, up there in Antioch and Syria, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So they take a collection up there in Syria, and they take that money and they send it back to the brethren, the Jewish brethren, who received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, back in the region of Judea and Jerusalem. Now we come to chapter 12, and we read, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church out to God for him. So now looking at this passage here, we're back in the region of Judea and Jerusalem. Peter is the apostle of the circumcision. He's the apostle of the Jews. He's ministering in this region. And Herod now is the king in this time and he's doing some uh, dastardly work against the word of the Lord, which is not uncommon. Now I wanted to take a moment here just to show you Luke is an accurate historian. And Luke is going to mention some things in these four verses of an historical nature, as he mentioned in the last chapter, the days of Claudius Caesar, the time of Herod the king, the persecution in the region of Judea, and the uh, feast of Easter, and also the Jewish feast of unleavened bread. He's going to make some historical references here that are going to authenticate and make certain to you, that you may know the certainty of the words by which is being written here. So the first thing I want to do is I want to take a little time and teach you some things 
about the, the Herods. So you know some things about this family Herod because they come up a lot in Scripture. So turn back to Ezekiel chapter 35, 36 with me. And I want to show you about this uh, Herod family. Herod is not a personal name, like, like I'm Mike, you know, Brother Mike. That's my name, Mike. Herod is a surname. It's like my other name, Caesar. I'm Mike Caesar. Herod is the last name of this family. They, they, that particular surname will identify the various people that are in it. And there are, there's Archelaus and Antipas and Agrippa. There's a whole bunch of different Herods that we run into through the Scriptures. And Luke accurately records them, and it's been uh, verified by secular historians throughout the time, probably the best of which is Josephus, the complete works of Josephus. Now, Josephus was a Jewish man that lived just around the, this very time here that the book of Acts was written. He lived around 40, 50, 60, 70 A.D., and he recorded in a number of works, he was a paid to do this, paid to be a historian. He wrote the Jewish Antiquities. There are 20 books in the Jewish Antiquities and seven books of the Jewish War. And he chronicles the history of the Jews who are a very literate people and very careful people in documenting and uh, chronologies as you read in the book of Chronicles and in Genesis. Now, if you're in uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, let me catch up with you. There was a man by the name of Antipater the Idumean. And this man lived, oh, about uh, 50, 60, uh, 40 B.C., before the time of Jesus Christ. And uh, this particular man, uh, here you're reading in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 1, Also, thou son of man, prophesy unto the mountains of Israel, and say, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. And he's going to talk about certain mountains going on, because Israel is a region of hills and valleys and mountains. And he's going to say in verse 5, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen and against all I do mea, which have appointed my land into their possession with the joy of their heart, with despiteful minds, to cast it out for a prey. And to Potter the I do man. He was a man from Mount Seir, the region of I do mea, which is derived from Edom, if you remember back in Genesis chapter 36, and I'll just read a few verses to you from Genesis 36. But back when this thing is all being set up, it says in Genesis 36, These are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Um, Esau took his wives, verse 6, and his sons and daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle and all beasts and all his substance, which he had got in the land of Canaan. Canaan would be Israel. The Bible speaks of the land as the land of Canaan. That's the land that, that God gave to the Jewish people to establish a nation Israel. It was Canaan, and then it became the land of Israel. Those are the only names that God gave to it. I understand nowadays, I guess there's another name used. It's called the land of Palestine, some people call it. I don't know where that came from, although God does kind of mention in the Scriptures that one day people would call it by that name, but He said, uh, Woe unto you, He was going to destroy them for using that name. It's the land of Canaan, and it was given to the Jews. It's called Israel. And Esau, who was the brother of Jacob, the son of Isaac, uh, took his possessions and left the land of Canaan. And verse 8, He left and dwelt Esau in Mount Seir, Esau is Edom. Edom is Idum, Idumea. Idumea is the land of the Edomites. Okay? So what you were reading about in Ezekiel chapter 36 was Antipater the Idumean was a descendant of Edom, a descendant of Esau. And this particular man had a son. And the son he had eventually became King Herod the Great. This uh, son of his was a conquering uh, warrior type of a person. And what he had done was he began to move out of the region of Mount Seir by the Dead Sea and began to move in a westerly and a northerly direction and work his way up through the region of Judea and began to conquer. And finally, in 37 B.C., he conquered Jerusalem. Now, you can turn to uh, Luke chapter 2. 
And I'll take you through some references that Luke, a historian, is going to mention. But the prophecy was given to you right here in Ezekiel 36 that there would be people of the Edomites, these Idumeans, that would come in and take the land. And this is the prophecy being fulfilled here. I have spoken against the residue of the heathen against all Idumea. God looks at the Edomites as heathen, not as people of the covenant. Because he says to Moses, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And then later on, Paul will explain to us in Romans 9, 10, and 11 that you're not children of God by being children of the flesh. You must be children of the promise, Abraham, Isaac, and and Jacob, because Jacob becomes Israel, and you must come through that line. You cannot come through Abraham and Ishmael. That's no do. You cannot come through Abraham, Isaac, and Esau or Edom. That's no good in God's. That's not part of the covenant. He calls these Edomites, these Idumeans, heathen. They're outside of the covenant. So, in Luke chapter 2, the historian Luke writes that it came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now, what had happened was when Antipater's son, Herod, began his conquering, he finally worked his way north and took over Jerusalem in 37 B.C. And he conquered Jerusalem. Now, along the way, he had become friends with someone called Mark Antony, the general, the Roman general. And Mark Antony appreciated this warrior style of conquering and killing and, and the the bloody way that he did battle. And I guess warriors appreciate each other like criminals appreciate each other and things like that. And he thought, this is, this is a good conqueror. This is a good Idumean conqueror. And uh, he tells me he has some relationship to this Abraham and uh, we're having trouble here. So he goes to Caesar Augustus and he says, you know what you want to do is, is rather than fight against this guy, let's befriend him and bring him in and make him one of our underling kings to rule over that region because the Jews are a lot of problems. We, we have a lot of problems with these Jews. They've been fighting for the longest time from the times of the Maccabeans. I mean, they, they always seem to fight. No matter who rules them, they fight against it. And I remember the times in uh, Judas Maccabee and the fighting that they did around 170 when Antiochus Epiphanes from Syria had came and conquered the region and the Maccabeans fought them back and the Maccabeans became known as the Hasmoneans. Herod the Great was smart. He started to marry many wives and he married some of the Hasmonean women to bring them in because the Jews looked at the Hasmoneans and the Maccabeans as great heroes. And he figured, I'd marry into my family this way, bring some of the wives in to, to curry favor with these Jews so it would be easier to rule over them. So Mark Antony went to Caesar Augustus and said, why don't we make this guy one of our co-regents, our underling kings. And so Caesar Augustus coronated Herod the Great to be the king of of the Jews in the region of that land there of Canaan or Israel. He, they, he's going to be the king in this particular time. So, so this decree from Caesar Augustus uh, went out. Not only the world should be taxed, but in 37 B.C. that Herod would be the king. So when you turn back in Luke to chapter 1 and verse 5, you see there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. As of 37 B.C., King Herod ruled in that region and he ruled for 30 plus years until about, historians estimate, 4 or 3 B.C. is when he died. And he ruled in that entire region. And it was at that particular time when Zechariah the priest was praying and got the vision that they would have John the Baptist. And it was in that particular time when Mary uh, espoused being great with child came to have the child born. And that's the particular Herod that you read of in Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, the birth of Jesus, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem. There's this particular King Herod, King Herod the Great, that married into the Maccabean family, and uh, one of the children he had is going to go on. You'll read about him in Matthew 2 a few verses later. Because we know what happens. This particular Herod was a wicked uh, man. Uh, we read in verse uh, 16 what he did. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. 
when he had found out from the wise men that they had seen that star two years earlier, and he did not want any other king of the Jews, that would be Jesus Christ, to reign, he wanted his rule and his reign secured. He figured the best way is to kill the baby. And so I want all babies killed from the age of two and under. I mean, I don't know which one is this Jesus baby. Kill them all. So he went and he killed all the babies. And you've got to think about that. I mean, what, what, what that would do to a community when the soldiers come in and they take every child that's under the age of two years old and kill it. First, that's going to put a lot of public teachers out of work in a few years because when it's time for them to go to kindergarten and first grade, there's going to be no kindergarteners. There's going to be no first graders. There's going to be no children going through school for two successive years for a long time. There's going to be a break because all the children are dead. And he went forth and had all the children killed. This Herod the Great was a, a murderous man. He had members of his own family killed when he was thinking, perceiving that maybe they were plotting against him. He was a wicked man. And he had many wives and many children. And he wrote in his will, after he intermarried with the Hasmoneans and the Maccabees, that his oldest child, Archelaus, would rule in his place when he died. And so later on we see what happens is, verse 19, when Herod was dead, Matthew 2:19, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Arise, take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel. The angel had warned Joseph to take the child out of the region of Israel during the slaying in that period when everyone from two and under was killed. But after Herod was dead, you now can bring the child back and what happened was, when he's coming back in Israel, verse 21, he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod and was afraid to go thither. So he went up into the region of Galilee where Herod did not have his reign. So what happens is Herod Archelaus now takes over around probably 4, maybe 3 B.C. and he has about a 10-year reign. Now, interestingly, what happened during this particular reign is... When, when this son took over the throne, the Jews had been stirring up rebellion for a long time. We are not pleased. Thousands demonstrated in the streets and they sent a delegation of 50 Jews to Rome around the time that Archelaus ascended to the throne by the will of his father. And, and they, they went and they, they said, what we would like in, in, to keep peace in Judea is if you want us to keep quiet, what we'll do is we'd like a theocracy established where we're able to rule according to the, the Word of God, but we're willing to have that theocracy under a civil authority of a Roman procurator. And so what happened is, um, they, the uh, Romans, because of the constant uprising of the Jews in their various places, uh, agreed to that. They said, well, you know, Archelaus just can't make himself king. Archelaus is not as popular and uh, with uh, Caesar Augustus and with the Caesars as uh, Herod the Great was. Uh, it's no skin off our nose to depose him. So they removed him from the throne in 6 AD and they, they uh, banished him to Vienna in Gaul, France. And what they did was they, they established his younger brother, Herod Antipas, in 6 AD to be the ruler. This is what the, the Roman authorities did. But they did it in such a way, they said, you know, the biggest problem we're having is the trouble in this region around the temple. And they want a theocracy and a Roman procurator, so will they grant them, we'll grant them such. And we'll allow a Roman procurator to sit kind of as a civil authority, but the Jews, theocracy, can run the Jewish people, and they seem to be happy with that. And we'll set the area up into what's known as tetrarchs. So now when you turn back to Luke 3, just giving you some history here. This is verified, documented, accurate history, and, and that's the thing I love about this Bible is when you check it out historically, all the facts line up. And people do try to gainsay the Bible, but the more they check it out, if they're willing to be honest and to do the research, they will find out that these, these facts are verifiable. You can trust the Word of God. If you can trust it historically, then you can also trust it spiritually and what it says about the Lord Jesus Christ, that He died for your sins, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day, and that He'll grant you salvation if you'll confess Him and place your faith in Him. It's a good book. So now when you get to Luke chapter 3, historically you see what's happening here is in uh, verse 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, now Tiberius Caesar be, was reigning for a while, Pontius Pilate is the governor of Judea. We've got a Roman procurator in the region of Judea. 
but we don't want to cut off the Herod family entirely. Herod can be the Tetrarch of Galilee. His brother, Philip Herod, can be the Tetrarch of uh, uh, Ituria and of the region of Trachonitis. And the other brother, Philip Lysanias, can be the Tetrarch, uh, uh, Herod Lysanias, the Tetrarch of Abilene. And so the Herod family has its rule, but not where the temple is anymore. They've been banished from having that particular rule in the region of the temple. The procurators are ruling under the time of Caesar Tiberius. Now this particular Herod, this particular Herod right here in Luke chapter 3, verse 1, his, his Herod Antipas is his name. He has a rule from 6 A.D. to 39 A.D. This is the Herod that you're going to encounter through most of the scriptures. This is the Herod, if you're in Luke, turn to Luke 9. Luke 9, verse 7. Luke 9, verse 7. Now, Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him. You might want to take that top fan and turn that off. Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him. That's John the Baptist. And he was perplexed because it was said of some that John the Baptist was risen from the dead. People were superstitious. Okay? Only one has risen from the dead, never to go back to the grave, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But they had some superstition. Some thought he was John the Baptist risen from the dead. Some thought Jesus was Elias risen from the dead. Some thought it was one of the prophets. Verse 9, And Herod said, John, have I beheaded? He's a good Herod. He's not afraid of killing people. But, but he had killed John the Baptist. This is the Herod Antipas from Luke chapter 3 that you see in Luke chapter 9 and you see in Luke chapter 23. Herod Antipas. Luke chapter 23. Again, the region is now broken up into tetrarchs. Tetra is a, 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 a prefix word that means four. Okay? And arc is a rule. And there are four places of rule. And he has the rule up in the north region in Galilee. And of course, in the southern region around Judea, the Roman procurator Pilate rules. And the Sanhedrin has the authority underneath them for the theocracy. Okay, so Pilate, this is, this is the time, this is the chapter of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. They've now brought J Jesus Christ before Pilate. They're bringing accusations against him. Uh, Pilate said in verse 4, I find no fault in this man. And I say, Amen. Does anybody here find any fault in the man Christ Jesus? I think we all say Amen. amen. I think if anyone would search it out, you cannot find any fault in Jesus. He, he, was, he was a man of glory. He was a man of grace, but he was never a man of guilt. He had no sin. There was no fault in that man. You, could, you can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I find no fault in him. Even a Roman procurator saw it. Verse 5, but the religious people were <laughs> the more fierce. He stirreth up the people, teaching all Jewry, beginning from Galilee unto this place. And when Pilate heard of Galilee... He asked whether the man were a Galilean, and as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee, that had that long 30-plus year reign, that's the one he's talking about. He sent Jesus to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time for the Feast of the Passover. Because Herod continued to boast, after all, we're Idumeans, we have a blood relationship to Abraham. Now, it was lip service. It's just lip service. It's like a lot of religious people do today. They have lip service. Uh, a lot of people that I talk to, I'm a Lutheran. I'm a Catholic. I'm a this. And they give a lot of lip service to the religion. As you begin to query them and ask them, well, just how devout are you in your faith? Well, I miss. I go twice a year. I don't believe everything they tell me. I disagree with the Pope on this issue. I disagree with that. But it's a lip service. To religion. Herod was willing to give lip service to religion. He's willing to go to two big feasts a year, Easter and Christmas, if you will. Okay? Passover and Tabernacles. But he didn't have a heart to know God. He got an opportunity, this Herod Antipas had an opportunity to stand right before the living God in the person of Jesus Christ. And and he mocked him. And he questioned him. And then he, he set him at naught. But this is the Herod that we're reading of, is Herod Antipas, the younger brother of Archelaus. He's the Tetrarch of Galilee under the time of uh, Tiberius Caesar. Now, 
he had a son, Herod Agrippa I. And his son was given, when Lysanias died in 37 AD, his son was given opportunity to begin reign in the region where Lysanias was reigning, which is out in the Syrian region, while Herod Antipas continued to be the Tetrarch of Galilee. Um, When Antipas died two years later, that son Agrippa I expanded his reign over Galilee and was given reign over Jerusalem because at that point Tiberius Caesar was no longer on the throne, Caligula was on the throne. And Caligula couldn't care less about Jewish people and their uprisings spill their blood and kill them. We're not looking to make friends. We're not looking to make deals. I don't want to sit down with these people. Just kill them. And so he gave it to the Herods because the Herods were much more likely to kill than the Roman procurators were because they were always trying to be political and make the peace. So he expanded the region. When you come to Acts chapter 12, where we are today, that's the Herod that it's referring to in Acts chapter 12. It's now Herod Agrippa I. And his reign has been expanded by Caligula. And he's given authority to do whatever you want with whomever you please, except the Romans. Don't touch the Romans. You'll answer to me for that. But in terms of the Jews and any other heathen, you can do what you want to them. So this is the Herod Agrippa that we're reading of. Herod Agrippa I, Acts chapter 12, verse 1. He has his rule from 37 A.D. to 44 A.D. This chapter is written around 43 44 A.D. This is the time this is happening. It's about 9, 10, 11 years after the resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the, the passage of the Acts of the Apostles, has the Lord gave the first five, six, seven years in offer to the Jews and now begins to turn as he swings that pendulum going to the uttermost parts of the earth. And we're in this region right here as we're reading about it. Uh, just to give you a little bit more so when we get to it, I don't want to have to do this again. I'm going to do it once and that's it. So take your notes on the Herods and that's it. I'm not going to do it when we get there again. But when we get to Acts chapter 25, I want to show you there's another Herod that comes on the scene. And it's going to be the son of this Herod Agrippa the first. It's going to be Herod Agrippa the second. Acts chapter 25. And and verse 13, after certain days came King uh, Agrippa and Bernice, and they came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. This is Herod Agrippa II. He has his rule from about 50 A.D. to 70 A.D. And this is written around maybe 62 A.D. And now we're looking 20 years later and we're looking at the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Herod Agrippa I is going to persecute Peter. Hera Agrippa II is going to hear, in a way, the Apostle Paul. He won't so much persecute him. He's actually going to, if you will, releasing him. And, and, and we'll read about that when we get there in Acts 25. What had happened was, you'll notice there's a six-year break from 44 A.D. to 50 A.D. What had happened was, after Caligula lost his control at the throne, if you're still in Acts 25, look at the 11th verse. Acts 25, 11. He says that Paul saying, um, and even 10, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, end of verse 11, I appeal to Caesar. The Caesar that he's appealing to is now Claudius Caesar. Now Claudius Caesar is ruling. After Caligula died, there was a lot of problems because of Herod Agrippa I's rule in Jerusalem with the bloodletting that he had. And... Uh, and, and we're going to see later in chapter 12, Herod Agrippa I will die. And he dies in 44 AD. And what happened was uh, Claudius Caesar said, you know, we, we've got to go back to having Roman procurators in the region of Judea. They're, they're more political. <laughs> they do a better job. They know how to sit down at the table and negotiate these deals and get some kind of a compromise. And so he set up the Roman procurator Cuspius Fundus from 44 AD to 50 AD. But Claudius Caesar took a great liking to Herod Agrippa II the one that you just read about in Acts 25, the one that Paul spoke to. Of all the Herods, this was probably the nicest Herod. And Claudius Caesar himself liked him. He was only 17 years old when his father died in 44. And Claudius Caesar said, he's too young to be put in charge, but I want to train him. And he trained him personally for six years. And when he thought he was ready at the age of 23, he came back and he set him up as the ruler.
Judea at that time that we read of in Acts 25. And uh, so I hope you kind of followed that. Are there any questions? I just wanted to go through the history with you. The Bible is an accurate historical document. This history has been uh, verified. Again, I showed you in the works of Josephus, the works of Eusebius, the Roman historians. This is all verified. And just so when you're reading through, you see the name Herod, 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 and Herod. There are five Herods through from the beginning of Matthew until Acts 25. And just so you know who the players are and what they did. And that's written up there for our edification and understanding. All right, now we'll move back to the text. I want to study some things here as we're studying here in the Acts of the Apostles. And we're looking at the work of the Apostles, finishing up the work in Judea and Samaria before the Lord sends Paul on all these wonderful missionary journeys that we'll be studying in the next number of chapters in the second half of the book. So, this particular Herod that we're looking at, this um, Herod Agrippa I, uh, stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, hey, I'm always fighting with the Jews, and all of a sudden they like this. The Jews are happy that I'm killing members of the body of Christ. Religious people are happy to see the people of God put to death. Religious people do not like the people of God. Or let me put it this way. They do not like the people of God that speak the words of God. The people of God that keep their mouth shut, they don't have much of a problem with. But the people of God that are willing to speak the word of God, that, that they don't like. Uh, turn with me to Psalm 120. I just want to show you this in, in the Bible. So if you want to get along with the world, keep your mouth shut. However, if you want to get along with God and do what you're told to do, after the powers come upon you, you should be witnesses unto me, then, then you open your mouth for the Lord Jesus Christ and His gospel. Who do you want to please, men or God? Well, the church was pleasing God, speaking the words of God. Look at look in, in Psalm 120. As the psalmist is on his way to worship, the 15 songs of degrees that they would, they would sing as they would go to Jerusalem for the feast days. And he says in verse 6, My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. He's saying, I'm, I'm one of the children of God in the Old Testament. I'm a Jew that loves God. And if you're in the New Testament, you're a child of God through faith in Christ Jesus if you're a born-again Christian. And if you're a child of God, you're dwelling with people that hate peace. They hate the peace of God, which bringeth salvation. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. They like a false peace. Verse 7, I'm for peace. I'm for peace. But they are for war. Now, it'd be nice if that's all the verse said. But notice how the verse is written. I am for peace, but when I speak... They are for war. If I keep my mouth shut, they're just fine with me. So if you're a born-again Christian that keeps your mouth shut, you're going to do just fine with the people of the world. Even hair will get along with you. But if you're a born-again Christian, like these people were in the church in Acts chapter 12, that were preaching on the streets, passing out their versions of Bible tracts, that were going around and, and in the marketplace, turning the world upside down, talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, the Jews didn't like that. Religious people hate that. And Herod found out if you kill one of those church people, oh, the religious people like that a lot. So I just killed one. You know what? Verse 2, I killed James too. And not only that, uh, this pleased the Jews. Let's take Peter. And he took Peter also. Now, now James... If you remember, James was one of the first apostles, disciples, chosen by Jesus Christ. Uh, back, back in Matthew chapter 4, when the Lord Jesus Christ, after his baptism in the Spirit, and after going out and, and taking the devil on one-on-one, -on -one, fasting 40 days, and beating the devil, he went out and he started to call disciples. And in verse 21, going on from calling Peter and Andrew, he, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. These are two men, James and John, that had a real heart for God. Probably, definitely more than I do. <laughs> And probably more than 99.9% .9 of Christians. Because they were willing to leave their family and their occupation to follow Jesus. And I probably wouldn't be willing to leave either. No offense. It's just, I mean, I still got my family, I still got my occupation. 
But they just left it all and followed Jesus. This is a heart for God that is, I marvel when I read these things. And they, these, this James and John and Peter became part of the inner circle. As you read through the scriptures, Matthew 17, the Mount of Transfiguration, there's James and John and Peter. You read about the time Jairus' daughter dies and he comes and he begs Jesus to come to my house. And when Jesus comes to the house to heal that little girl, that 12-year-old girl, it's Peter and James and John that go into the upper room with Jesus as he heals that little girl. Uh, when, when you read about the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, and if you're a Christian that wants to know some good doctrine about the Lord, you want to read those two chapters. But if you read carefully in the corresponding chapter, Mark 13, who was it was that, that went up on the mountain to hear that discourse from Jesus? It was Peter, James, John, and in that time Andrew joined them. Andrew was another very close one. They are part of the inner circle. They, they, and you wonder, you wonder, well, Jesus has this inner circle. It doesn't seem fair. You know, how big is that inner circle? As big as you want it to be. Why is it that Peter, James, and John, and sometimes Andrew, were with Jesus at these important events? You, you know what I think happened? I think that as the, the day went about, and Jesus went about his activity, some of the other people started to take care of their activities of daily living, and did their thing, and wandered off from Jesus for a few hours, and then caught up with him later at night. And they wandered off. But these three stayed close to him. Amen. But what about you? Good. I mean, you know, that circle's as big as you want it to be. God would like it to be real big. Unfortunately, not many people want to get in it. But you can be a Peter. You can be a James. You can be a John. The Lord desires to have fellowship with us. Often we're too busy to have fellowship with Him. I'm guilty of that myself sometimes. And then when I go back to Him in in the course of the day, I say, Lord, you know, forgive me. I don't know where my mind's been. I need more fellowship with you. I need to get close to you again. I know things catch us up during the day. But you can be on that inner circle. Jesus is always welcoming. Come unto me. All. All. He didn't say just Peter, James, and John. All you. All ye. That's not, not, not a call for, just not a call for salvation. That's a call for fellowship. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. And, and, and they were in there. Now, now, this pleased the Jews when this particular James was killed. Why? I think maybe if you read in Mark chapter 3 and Luke chapter 9 might give you an insight into it. Mark chapter 3, and then we'll go to Luke chapter 9. Mark chapter 3, when the Lord Jesus was ordaining the twelve apostles. He had a number of disciples and he ordained twelve of them to be apostles. There are twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he called these, uh, he gave them power. Verse 14, he ordained twelve that they should be with him, that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out devils. That's for apostles. If you're not an apostle, you can't do that. Guess what? I'm not an apostle. Neither are any of you. And neither are any of you watching me out there in TV land. And neither any of you out there watching me on TV land who are on Christian TV land who claim you are. There were 12 apostles. Jesus ordained them. He didn't ordain you an apostle. The foundation of apostles is laid, finished, and done. We're reading the historical acts of the apostles. You can be a disciple now. But an apostle you can't be. He's not ordaining them anymore. And when he ordained them, verse 17, James the son of Zebedee, And John, the brother of James, he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. These were boys, James and John, that were bold and spake out and didn't need a microphone like I do. I don't have much of a voice. I'm not a son of thunder. I'm a son of a whimper or something. But, but, But these guys were sons of thunder. They could get out and they could preach on the streets. And, and they had a spirit about them, a zealous spirit for God, so much that in Luke chapter 9, they had a, such a zealousness for Jesus. They so loved the Lord and hated evil, that in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, a great verse, we've studied it before, it came to pass when the time was come that he, Jesus, should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. 
And he sent messengers before his face and they went and they entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, be ready for the king. Here he comes, be ready. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Jesus is now purposed. I'm no longer going to be turning bread loaves into feeding thousands. It's now time, mine hour has come to die for sins, which is much more important than doing miracles. Because through my death, burial, and resurrection, then I'll bring forth the new life and the new birth. And that's the greatest miracle of all. But the people weren't happy about that. Verse 54, And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elias did? That's Elijah. They're the sons of thunder. Nobody rejects their Lord. They want instant judgment. I can understand why the Jews were happy when, uh, when Herod <laughs> took James and put him to death. This was a bold street preacher. This is the guy that's going to break up their, their parades and their festivities and their holidays and their pagan festivals with the preaching of the Word. Now shut that guy up. Sons of Thunder. Boy, we need some Sons of Thunder today, don't we? Amen. We're getting in the last days. I mean, it's all coming full circle. And somebody's got to be willing to stand for the Lord and to preach that gospel. And James did it. And of course, <laughs> Herod... <laughs> Herod uh, Agrippa I decided that, uh, you know, we're going to put an end to that. That's the James we're talking about. The Jews were pleased that he was killed. God was pleased that he used the voice that God gave him to speak the words of God. After all, that's why we're put here, is to glorify God. To give pleasure to our God. To speak the words of God. What better thing is there to fit in the tongue of our mouth than the very words of God? If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. That's really what your tongue is made for. And James and John, the sons of thunder, they went out and they did that. Well, Herod sees that he's winning some favor, currying favor with the Jews, so he says, let's take this Jewish apostle that's really causing trouble back there in Jerusalem, Peter, and let's apprehend him and put him in prison. And he delivered him unto four quaternions of uh, soldiers. This is four different groups of soldiers. I think one group for each limb. One group for the right arm, one group for the left arm, one group for the right leg, one group for the left leg. Why was that? Well, well, if you, you turn back a little ways, there had been some problems before in Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, the high priest Verse 17, rose up, and all they were the Sadducees, and filled with indignation, and they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. This is Peter and John and the apostles. Verse 19, but an angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth. And the angel said, go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Do what you're supposed to do. Preach the gospel. That's what we're doing. The angel's here not to minister to your needs, but literally to free you up so that you can minister to the needy people that need to hear the gospel. So what happens? Verse 21. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him and called the council together, and the senate of the children of Israel sent them to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they found them not in the prison. They returned, they told the high priest, hey, the, the, verse 23, the prison truly found we shut with all safety. And the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. And so, so Herod's saying, that's not going to happen with me. Okay, We're not just going to have prisons out, prison uh, guards outside the door. We're going to have quaternions of soldiers in there m m minding each arm and leg and limb. Peter's not getting out when I lock him up. After all, I'm Herod. I'm not one of those religious high priests. And we're going to see how the Lord's going to work this out too. Now, now here's where we're going to run into a bit of a controversy. Not 15 minutes? All right. I'll probably have to teach it next week. All right. 
so, so we'll, we'll probably finish up tonight or this morning with, with this passage here. And uh, next week I want to examine some of the perfectly written words in, in God's authorized version of the Bible. As we're going to notice that uh, Herod apprehends Peter and puts him in prison and intends to bring him out after Easter. End of verse 4. Intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. And we're going to study this out next week. And, uh, and that's all we have for this morning. So let's thank the Lord in prayer for our teaching and we'll take questions after. Uh, Father, we thank you for the, uh, the word of God. Lord, we thank you that it's accurate historically as an historical document. And uh, Lord, thank you for the good historians that even though they were not your children, they recorded enough truth that we can see, Lord, that we can trust the very words you've put in this Bible. And the most important words are those that testify of your son. And, and that he came and he did your will. And that he made his body an offering for sin. And Lord, that you've raised him from the dead. And, and the preachers have preached from the time of Peter and James and John to this very day. And Lord, thank you for giving us eternal life. In Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.